Hey everybody, it's Dave Dugdale, LearningDSLRVideo.com. We have JJ from ASUS today, and we're to we gonna build a, not a monster, but we're probably gonna end up building a beast of a computer. It's, I'd agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for video editing, especially for like 4K, like with the GH4 coming out and the, the A7S being able to shoot 4K pretty soon. Um, you know, in terms of content creation, uh, this is going to be one heck of a computer. And you're going to actually probably watch JJ do it because the reason I, you, JJ contacted me, he said, you want to build a computer? I'll build a real monster of a computer. Because he saw my last computer build I did about a year and a half ago, that computer I called the monster. Yeah. And then I had also seen everything you had been doing recently. And I thought this platform that we have coming up, right, is perfect for content creators. And so I said, why not actually work with an actual content creator who can provide his insight and expertise in the same way that I can be my insight and expertise on the platform. And I think it would be really interesting uh, and edifying for you know the viewers out there. Yeah, and, and one of the reasons, the big reason is JJ is amazing when it comes to computers. This guy knows so Thank much you. stuff, I don't even know what he knows. So to have him here and like, you know, as we're building it, be able to say, hey, why are you doing it this way? Can we, you know, and after it's built, you know, do we do it this way or that way? A um, lot of little different tweaks can all add up to your performance, especially for video editing and not dropping frames. So JJ, why don't you tell them what kind of components are going into this computer? So uh, there's actually a lot that's going into the system because it's an entirely brand new platform and architecture. So when you kind of built your system, it was based off of uh, pretty much the highest end chipset and CPU that Intel had at the time, uh, which was the X79 chipset and the Sandy Bridge processor. Um, but now for this generation, we've got the new X99 chipset. Uh, and that's going to be bringing in a whole new slew of things. So one, we've got a brand new Extreme Edition CPU. So this new CPU is the world's first eight core 16 thread desktop, desktop class uh, overclockable base CPU. So it's, uh, you know, uh, eight cores, 16 threads, 20 megs of cache, 3.3 gigahertz, and it's overclockable. It's beastly in terms of its performance. Um, on top of that, it actually offers DDR4, uh, which goes perfectly with our motherboard. And the motherboard that we've put in there is an X99 deluxe base board. So it's a fantastic board. I think it's actually a little bit higher end than the board that you even have in your current system. It's got all the bells and whistles, all the storage, you know, SATA, SATA Express, M.2, Wi-Fi and board, expands for multiple GPUs, all kinds of crazy stuff. And some really great features that I think as we hopefully go through this build, you guys will see uh, uh, some really interesting things that can help you as enthusiasts and as users. Um, as far as the chassis, we've got NZXT's, NZXT's H630 uh, in white, which actually matches our board. Uh, not that you know you need it to, but uh, you know, licks don't hurt, uh, but it's got a lot of great usability and cooling. Uh, we've got a really great cooling solution and NZXT's Kraken X61. So it's a really big closed loop uh, water cooling solution. It's gonna help us to be able to heavily overclock or overclock capable CPU. Uh, hopefully that even gets us better performance. Um, on top of that, we've got 64 gigabytes of that DDR4 memory to go on the board. Uh, that's crucial 2133 memory. Um, and then on top of that, powering it all because the power supply is a definitely important part, especially with this type of platform. We've got a thousand watt uh, NZXT Hale uh, Gold Series fully modular PSU. And then on the storage side, we've got two SSDs, uh, MX100s from Crucial, 512 gigabytes. Be able to give us some solid, really uh, good performance. And um, GPU wise, probably a bit more than we need for content creation purposes, but kind of lines up with this system here. We got a GTX 780 Ti DirectCU 2 graphics card. Um, there's a card reader that we threw in there just to have a card reader because you know every content creator needs a card reader. Uh, that's an Aperture M from NZXT. And I think that just about wraps it up. I mean, we've got, I think, a couple of extra fans in there, but for the most part, that uh, defines our whole build. So I don't, as you guys know, I don't like taking product from manufacturers, so I'm actually not going to take this for free. Um, one of the things I did when my monster computer, it, I don't, by the time it was done, it would cost about 2,300, 2,400 to build. Uh, whereas this new computer is not cheap. It's coming in around $3,000 without it even any drives in it. If you put the two drives in, it's probably about 3,400. So what I'll probably end up doing, um, since I don't want to do the, I'll find out what ASUS's uh, charity of choice is and give away my old computer, which is still, a great computer. Yeah, it's, 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 it's still it's a amazing, very high-end content It's an amazing system. computer. And then whatever the difference is from that, I'll write a check to whatever their, their favorite charity of choice is in their name. Um, so without further ado, I, I let's get started. Let's get started on this build. 
JJ was at my office for about a day and a half and I recorded about three hours of the build. It was tough, but I cut the video down to about 20 or 30 minutes with the best content. This is not really a how-to computer build that shows you every step of what to do. It's more about me asking questions during the build that were really important to me. The first question I asked was about graphics cards since it seems like my old GTX 680 was never working that hard on playback. You've got a 680 which is a pretty good choice but probably the bigger benefit might have been the, the 4 gig frame buffer but that's only if you're doing like really really high bit rate video but in many situations there's kind of like a, a cutoff point with the GPU at a certain point the GPU even if you keep getting faster and faster GPU because of the way that a lot of these video applications are designed for acceleration they don't generally know how to use the additional portions of the GPU to keep getting improvements okay. so you can let's say put in GTX 760 or but uh, in your era, when you bought like the 680, you could have bought like a 660 as opposed to the 680, and you probably would have seen 90 to 95 percent of the same exact performance, um, but at a significantly lower price oh, yeah. because it can't actually utilize those additional cores and shaders and technologies that the graphics card, which are predominantly more geared towards gaming yeah. than they are towards content creation. There seems to be a lot of confusion out there with power supplies when it comes to a high-end computer build like this one. So I asked him what his thought was on a good size for this build. Uh, a silver to gold 750 watt is probably going to entirely take care of you and still give you kind of headroom. Um, so that's going to be okay. 1000 watt really is more so for situations where I would probably say you're definitely overclocking and you've got a high level of expansion that's integrated into the system. Um, more than that really becomes very conditionally specific. You would have to really have that much extra hardware in the system. Um, but definitely don't undercut on the quality. You know, like the PSU we're using right here, this is an NZXT. It's, um, it's a 90 plus gold uh, and it's a thousand watts. So it's got a lot of extra headroom, but also because, you know, we, we're putting in some fairly high end parts as far as, you know, we've got pretty much the flagship CPU. We've got a ton amount of memory. We've got a GPU, just those under full load um, altogether, we would probably easily be looking at, you know, probably about 500 watts in terms of the pool. So having, you know, that extra kind of headroom, it's nice to have, but it really just depends on what you're doing with the system. Since I ran out of fast Intel 6 gig SATA ports on my last ASUS motherboard, I wanted to know what this new ASUS board had to offer. Um, has standard based SSDs or mechanical hard drives would plug into here. Um, but then down here, we have four ports that either can serve as SATA 6G ports or also can serve as two of the new SATA Express. So SATA Express is the replacement specification for standard SATA. So this offers 10 gigabits, normal SATA offers six gigabits, and this also offers 10 gigabits. So this board actually comes with every single um, specification that exists right now for high speed based storage. You've got the M.2, Serial ATA, and SAT Express. And of course, if you use a PCI based SSD, you've got tons of PCI based SSD connectivity. I was confused on my first build how to arrange the fans in the case and which way to move the air. So I asked him how he was going to build this new one and where the airflow was going to go. What we've gone ahead and done is we earlier noted we've set up this fan to set up as an intake. So that means we're gonna be bringing cool air in to the chassis. And actually the top of the chassis, while it's actually covered, actually does have side inlets surrounding it. So that means that cool air will come in then be drawn in here and then that'll be blown across the actual motherboard. So the top portion, which is the hottest operating portion. Here on this side, the actual chassis has uh, side intakes here. So that'll help to draw an air in. And then we've got these large fans that'll bring in air and it'll draw it across the actual motherboard. And then it will exhaust outside of the chassis. As we can see here, we've got the back, ex back exhaust fan. And then we have a large amount of venting on all the PCIe slots as well as in the chassis itself. So that's going to help for all give us a uh, pretty effective airflow for the entire inside of the chassis, uh, as well as just from the design overall, still, still help to keep it pretty quiet.
On the rare occasion that I needed to use Thunderbolt, I wanted to know if this build would have access to Thunderbolt capabilities. Um, Thunderbolt actually came out after the original advent of X79, but it couldn't be easily added in because there was chipset requirements. But for this X99 chipset versus the X79 chipset, uh, you will actually be able on any ASUS board be able to add in Thunderbolt. So we've got like this little card, and we'll show you guys actually how it connects specifically once we put incorporate it into the build. Um, but this will allow you to go ahead and leverage it. And uh, the great thing is you even have flexibility. You can get it in a single port solution or even a dual port solution. But Thunderbolt, of course, supports daisy chaining, so you could even have up to six concurrently uh, connected devices. But this is a great option for you guys that have very high speed uh, or more professional multimedia-based devices that require Thunderbolt connectivity. Next, I was curious how this build would compare to a high-end Mac Pro. Yeah, so there's actually quite a number of distinct advantages. I think one, just from a platform architecture, the Mac Pro, while it's actually a fairly recent system, it is using actually fairly dated platform architecture because it's based off of the X79 architecture. So it's actually the same system you built on is what it's fundamentally built on. So the CPU architecture compared to one this, this is the brand new generation. This is the Haswell E. So it features faster architectural, just clock to clock. Uh, there's more cores, there's more cache. Overall, it's a superior CPU compared to any CPU you can put in the Mac Pro. Um, the next one is going to be the Mac Pro doesn't offer DDR4. So this offers DDR4 capabilities, uh, which offers superior bandwidth and superior performance. And then also if you look at memory density, there's a couple of very high density kits that you can buy from Mac Pro, but I think the highest density memory kit is about in the price range of about two $2,500 or so. Um, here we've already got 64 gigs and that's going to be pretty much almost the limit of what you could do on a Mac Pro. But that's only the entry point of what X99 is essentially allowing you on the high-end space. If in you know a year and a half you decide you want to put in more memory, at a much lower cost you have the ability to be able to go to not only higher speed memory, which is not an option on the Mac Pro because they have limitation on memory speeds, um, but you can go to even higher densities. So in two years, I don't know, your workflow turns into the requirement that you need 128 gigabytes of memory. That is an entire option, so that's another benefit. Um, now, the Mac Pro has a lot of Thunderbolt, but this platform will also offer Thunderbolt. We're going to only offer two ports compared to, I think, the six total ports that you can have on a Mac Pro, but as the platform is daisy-chainable support with Thunderbolt, I think it's about parity. And we also have much more connectivity, right? There's USB 3, a total of, what, 14 ports that we have on this system. Um, and uh, we also support all the latest uh, chipset standards for storage. So there's M.2, there's SATA Express, and there's SATA. And that's pretty much something that can't be also done on the Mac Pro. And I think the last point will be the GPU. GPUs are playing an ever increasingly important part in uh, workflow acceleration. And so we have an NVIDIA part that uh, offers really great performance, um, but you could change it to whatever solution you want. With, with a Mac Pro, you're limited in that regard as well. So I think all the way around, we've got um, a really great foundation that even compared to the highest end Mac Pro, you're gonna be offering better performance across the board. to know what his thoughts were about RAID system versus an SSD for video editing for your main media drive. A RAID because you are physically utilizing those two drives and combining their workload performance, you are getting a more consistent improved level of performance versus in a software based environment. Depending on how that software and its algorithms work, it may not exactly benefit you in every scenario. With a RAID, RAID configuration, it would be more consistently improved upon. But as I said, you could do a RAID and also still incorporate the software solution so you could even get better. For example, with uh, higher performing uh, memory configurations and higher performing uh, solutions that use really well optimized programs, you could easily exceed 8 to 10 gigabytes of actually read or write performance if you were to utilize more advanced solutions in combination with like RAID. So um, when you take a look, I think right now some of your numbers are in about the 4 gig territory. You could double that or even go beyond that. With DDR4, there's even the possibility you could triple that throughput performance. Next 
next up, I asked them to give me a tour around the software that controls the motherboard. TPU, which is uh, essentially for adjusting all the frequency or performance related functions of the system. So if you were to go into that, this is where it allows you to essentially do overclocking, but dynamically in the operating system, you could adjust the frequency of each core, uh, you could do all core clocking, meaning all the cores would run at a single speed. You could make all the adjustments. But the truth is, <clears throat> for most users, this can still be fairly complex. They might not really know what mm, the values of adjustment are available to them, right? Um, here, the fan expert, that one's though pretty easy. What that does is that's that fan calibration technology, yeah. but with the full advanced layers of, of usability that we have now within the OS as compared to the still pretty cool functionality we had in that UEFI or that BIOS, but now we can do a lot more. I now have this little program here and I can click on this. Right. And this allows me to set parameters of performance per each application. Uh, so what that means is right here, this means it runs default, it runs stock, right? right? But if I click user, I can actually tell it what I want. So I, if I were to click this, you see how all the cores now have frequencies. Uh -huh. If I want that program to run at, let's say 4.8 gigahertz, right right, then I can set it to run at that. So if you have concurrent programs, the primary program that's in the foreground receives the prioritization. So if you see, if I add another one, it will then take on the value of being the second program and you can drag and drop these. So you can, you can define the priority if, if you want to, wow. let's say, have that one be the first one or the second one. That's cool. But that's a really advanced way of customizing. Like most people don't think about that because they think of their system running essentially uh, the same level of functionality all the time, all the time for yeah, every program. Yeah. But we don't need our programs to run that way, especially for some programs that take advantage of one kind of level of functionality compared to another. Like Lightroom, like I told you, it's really only well suited for one or two threads. So you'd much rather have it run very high frequency on two threads, but then like when you go into Premiere, Premiere can use all your threads. So you maybe run it at a lower frequency, but on all cores. So like four gigahertz on all cores, versus like when you're in Lightroom, it runs at 4.6 gigahertz, but only on two cores. After that, we ran a lot of tests to watch the CPU and the case temperatures, which were actually running cooler than my monster computer build I did before. Next up, JJ was able to overclock this particular chip to 4.3 megahertz. Next, I asked JJ, does overclocking the GPU really do that much for video editing? Uh, in, in our evaluation, when we've done testing, we found that generally it, it does not. The, the cores, the CUDA cores, have a much bigger impact than the frequency of the cores. But it is somewhat conditionally specific that we have seen that um, with, G, with the architecture, especially for NVIDIA-based graphics cards, they have something that's called power target utilization. So when you overclock the card, if you don't have sufficient power target available, you may not actually be fully rep you, you may not fully actually be using that overclocked frequency. So it's a little bit complicated. You have to be able to monitor that the card is still working within the power envelope, that it allows that overclock to exercise itself. Uh, in situations that the power target is still open or essentially still free to leverage the overclock, we have found that it can improve performance but it won't improve performance as much as CUDA cores. Um, but with that noted, you still have a kind of a limitation. Eventually, once you get to a certain class of GPU, generally jumping up to a higher and higher GPU, even with more CUDA cores, has a diminishing effect on the performance that it will offer in rendering. Then I asked him for the budget-minded people, which GPU is probably the best bang for the buck? I would say it's it's a GTX 760 class GPU. So that's about a about like a 230 to about a 250 dollar GPU. If you spend more than that, while you may potentially some improvements, uh, they'll be at a fairly small percentage point. Yeah, we have seen that in some conditions, having a little bit larger frame buffer for larger workloads, if the the VRAM is being heavily used in your workflow, can be beneficial. But you can get like a 760 with a four gig frame buffer. Um, doesn't mean that you have to jump up to a higher GPU, just need, maybe need one with a little bit more of a frame buffer, but you should kind of try to research and see, based on your workload, how much frame buffer is actively being utilized. We ran a bunch of tests comparing my old computer to the new one. In every case, it was faster and used less CPU during playback. It never dropped any frames with my GH4 4K footage or my A7S, the 5D, or GoPro. I plan to release a video in the future showing these tests after I do some more tweaking. All right, so that's pretty much it. I want to thank JJ for helping me out, put thank this you. thing together. Actually, he did all the work. I was just 
asking questions <laughs> as he was going along. Um, so I hope you guys got a lot out of it. Uh, the availability, the time this video hits, this particular chip and the motherboard um, should be out. And I'll have all links below in uh, either in the YouTube post or on my blog post as well where you can pick up some of these parts. So JJ, where, where can people find you? And if they have questions, mm -hmm. maybe there's other alternatives. What? Yeah, there's you know there's going to be a lot of different SKUs that are going to be out there at launch. Even for ourselves, we want the deluxe, um, but there'll even be um, you know other options. We'll have a pro board. We'll even have an entry level Dash A board, but they'll have tons of great features, great fan controls, auto overclocking, the turbo app feature that you loved. Um, that's also going to be on all three of them. So. You don't have to pick just the highest end board and I'll go into a lot more detail on that. If you guys want to find out more about that, you can visit uh, the PCDIY web website. That's PCDIY.asus.com um, and I'll have write-ups on different build recommendations, different guides. There'll be overview videos. If you guys have any questions, you can leave them on the website or on the YouTube channel. Um, I even generally try to do, I'm right now trying to do about like a weekly Q&A video too. So if you guys just have general questions, hey, I don't know which part to pick, does this work with this, or what this does this, um, you know, I'm more than happy and I try to answer as many questions as I can. So feel free to drop by and ask any questions. So we called that one the monster, we're calling this new one the beast. Um, so, cause it was funny, cause when I, I would look at people, how they were searching uh, on my website and a lot of people just called it Dave's uh, monster for a search term. <laughs> so we'll call this one Dave's beast. <laughs> But um, it, it, it's pretty amazing. It can pretty much, without hardly dropping any frames, play back uh, Red Epic 5K footage raw, um, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I think we were both impressed. I mean, it was really interesting for me to be able to actually see somebody and take their workflow and then apply it to the system. And actually we were going through each benchmark and seeing, wow, we've dropped this per percentage. We've dropped this much time. You know, I think that, and both of us were blown away when, like you said, the 5k footage and we, you know, we got even one instance where we dropped no frames, no frames. which we want to look into more <laughs> and I want to figure out. Um, but it was really awesome. And just overall, how much of a difference there was in that fluidity of performance. Uh, compared to even your overclock Sandy Ridge E system, which uh, was pretty awesome. So I think definitely it earned its name of being the beast. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you so much, boss. Talk to you guys later.